today we're looking at the Islamic understanding of who Jesus is and what he came to do, basically. This is part one of two. So the questions we're looking at are who is Jesus and what is the message of Jesus? Let's have a little listen to how our Muslim friends may answer these questions. We'll be discussing now the Prophet Jesus or Isa as we say in Arabic, peace be upon him. I'm gonna have to stop you right there. So Muslims believe that Jesus was just a prophet, like all the other Old Testament prophets, because Muslims erroneously believe that Judaism or the Torah of Moses is a precursor to Islam, while simultaneously believing that Adam and all of the Old Testament prophets were actually Muslim and also having to acknowledge the undeniable fact that Islam was born in the 7th century, way after Christ. Work your way around that maze. In Islam, the Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, is a great prophet. But we in Islam, however, do not believe that he was a physical begotten son of God. Neither do Christians. Christians do not believe that Jesus is the physically begotten son of God because we don't believe, contrary to what Muslims may think, we don't believe that God had sex with Mary. We don't believe in the deity of Mary. Spoiler alert, neither do Catholics. Misunderstanding. Big up to my Catholic brothers and sisters. We family. The father-son relationship is purely spiritual. The word begotten doesn't strictly mean the carnal act of procreation. We believe that he was a great man and a great prophet and messenger sent by Almighty God to teach the people and the children of Israel. And you'll see that even Jesus himself always said, even if we look in the Bible, that he came to the lost sheep of Israel to the children of Israel, and he never claimed to be the savior for the whole of mankind. In many places in the Bible, he refers to himself as being sent to the children of Israel for them to repent to their Lord and to go back to the law and the commandments of Moses. So Islam says that he is a great prophet of Islam. Muslims like to quote Matthew here, specifically chapter 10 verses 5 to 6 and 15 verse 24. So Jesus always said this, did he? Did he? First of all, it's important to realize that Jesus was born of the lineage of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, which some, if not all, Muslims believe. He was the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham centuries earlier. God's promise to Abraham was twofold. God promised to bless his lineage and that from his lineage would rise a blessing for all nations, all people. So bless Israel and bless all nations. In this promise, both the descendants of Israel and the Gentiles were to be blessed. We see confirmation of this when baby Jesus is taken to the temple for dedication. From these passages, we can understand Jesus' ministry to be likewise twofold. Because he was born of the children of Israel, his first mission was to reveal himself to the Israelites. They were God's chosen people and God had promised to bless them. These people were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It gets better, my Muslim friends. See, the thing is, the Quran bears witness to this distinction. Let's have a look. Surat us Sad, chapter 38, verses 45 to 46. And commemorate our servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, possessors of power and vision. Verily, we did choose them for a special purpose, proclaiming the message of the hereafter. Surat ul Bakari, chapter 2, verse 47. Children of Israel, call to mind the special favor which I bestowed upon you and that I preferred you to all others for my message. So the Quran attests to the distinction between the, the blessing of Israel and the not blessing of Gentiles. The children of Israel had grown hardened and indifferent to the things of God. Surprise, surprise, Israel forsook the Lord again. When will they learn, eh? It was necessary for Jesus to personally minister among them with signs and wonders in order to confirm that he was the long-awaited Messiah, prophesied in the Torah. This is why during his ministry, Jesus instructed his disciples 
to go only to the children of Israel. They were to hear the message first. This was their privilege as the people of God, the people of God's covenant. God bear loyal. Following the death and resurrection of Jesus, one of the disciples addressed the Israelites as follows. Acts chapter 3 verses 25 to 26 we read, And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, your descendants, all people on earth will be blessed. When God raised his servant, Jesus the Messiah, he sent him first to you, to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. First, Jesus came to them first, implying something after, because God's promise was twofold. Jesus is God's promise. He came to the Israelites first, and now initiate mission two, to bear the sins of the world and give his life for the salvation of all mankind. The scriptures are clear that salvation in Jesus is available to all. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8 we read, You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Matthew 28 19, Go make disciples of all nations. John 8 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Surat u Maryam? That's not the Bible. Well, looky here! Allah seems to be in agreement with me! Surat u Maryam, chapter 19, verse 21. And we wish to appoint him, Jesus, as a sign unto men, and a mercy from us. Notice how it doesn't say a sign only to the Israelites. We also believe in the Immaculate Conception, the miraculous birth of Jesus, that he was born from Mary but without a father. And we say, the Quran actually mentions, because many people, they use this to say that due to the fact that Jesus was born from this miraculous birth, this therefore means that he is divine. He is godly like, or he is a part of God. Christians do not believe that it is the immaculate conception that deifies Jesus. It's not the thing that makes him divine. We conclude that he's divine because that's who he presents himself to be. And that's who his early followers attested to him being. He either is who he said he is, or he is who Muslims say he is. Our Muslim friends will often demand that you show in the Bible where Jesus says the exact words, I am God, worship me. Don't be taken aback because this is an inconsistent and irrational demand and they know it is. That's why they use it as a tactic. That's why they're taught to ask this question. If we applied the same criteria, if we applied the same criteria, we could ask them to show us in the Quran where it says that to become a Muslim, one must use the exact words of the Shahada, the first pillar of Islam. That is, there is no God but God. Muhammad is the messenger of God. Oops, I guess I'm a Muslim now. Both statements in the Shahada are in the Quran, but they are not found in those exact words, nor in that order as a formula for a person to become a Muslim. So, is Jesus God or not? Let's keep it relevant. The Quran presents a criteria to discern between the true God and false gods. Surah 16 verse 17 and 20 to 21. Is he then who creates like him who does not create? And those whom they call on besides Allah have not created anything, while they are themselves created. Dead are they, not living, and they know not when they shall be raised. Surah chapter 25 verse 3 And they have taken besides him gods who do not create anything while they are themselves created and they control not for themselves any harm or profit like the black stone and they control not death nor life nor raising the dead to life. So false gods are created and have not created anything. False gods cannot bring death, cause life or resurrect and the objects of worship are dead. Implying God is the creator, God is the source of life, and God is ever living. Let's look at John chapter 1 verse 3 and 10. Through him all things were made, 
Without him, nothing was made that has been made. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. See also Acts chapter 9, verses 10 to 17 and 21. I won't read the whole thing. The bits to pay attention to are the reference to the believers calling upon the name of Jesus, meaning they are convinced of his deity, they are calling upon him as Lord. See also 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2, Colossians chapter 1 15 to 18, and Hebrews chapter 1 verses 2 to 3, 6, 8, and 10 to 12. Jesus is creator, and he is the one that they call upon. We also have 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 8 to 10, Revelation chapter 1 verses 17 to 18, and chapter 2 verse 8, where we read that Jesus conquered death and is alive now forever and ever. Finally, John chapter 1 verse 4, chapter 5 verse 21, 25, 28 to 29. I feel like I'm calling lottery numbers. Chapter 11 verses 25 to 27, chapter 14 verse 6, and we have Colossians chapter 3 verses 3 to 4. Now those were a whole load of verses. I encourage you to actually read them for yourselves rather than just take my word for it. I have included links in the description below for you to have a gander. Go for it. So the point here is that Jesus fits the criteria presented to us in the Quran for distinguishing a true deity. Now, I'm not silly, I know this will not satisfy Muslims. Since they are taught to pull the the Bible has been corrupted card whenever they're backed into a corner. Now, it's not the topic of this video to present the evidence that establishes the historical veracity of the New Testament, nor is it to demonstrate that the first century Christians confessed their belief in Jesus as God and his death and his resurrection. We will establish that in another video because I love that topic. I promise. This is also a miracle, but this does not make Jesus God or a physical son of God. And even if you look back into the language used in Aramaic and the language of Jesus, when they used the word they never actually used the word son. The original languages, they described the servant of God. But when it translated down the line, they started to translate it after the concept of Saint Paul, as they call him, where he brought up the physical son of God. God the Father and God the Son does not connote a physical relationship. Muslims seem to be the only people who think that Christians think that Jesus is the physically begotten Son of God. Let's look at this mistranslation claim. Since he doesn't give specific examples, we will look at the verses most commonly used by Muslims when trying to establish this criticism. The first typical assumption is that the Greek word pais must always mean servant. Acts chapter 3 verses 13 and 26 and chapter 4 verses 27 and 30. These verses are in the AKJV version. We can see that Christ is being referred to as his son Jesus and thy holy child Jesus. The RSV, however, renders these verses differently, saying his servant Jesus, his holy servant Jesus. These differences have led some Islamic apologists to contend that the earliest Christian confession wasn't that Jesus was God's son, but rather his servant. In fact, and I'll demonstrate, the earliest Christian proclamation was that Jesus is the unique son of God. First, the Greek word that the RSV renders servant, paida, doesn't always refer to a servant. There are places where this word is used to refer to a child. In John chapter 4 verses 43 to 54, we read about the healing miracle of a certain royal official's son. The royal official refers to his son as his Pais or Paidian, which obviously doesn't mean servant, since we establish from the context that he's talking about his child. And in Luke chapter 2 verses 6 to 32 and 40, we read about baby Jesus being dedicated at the temple. In light of that context, speaking of Jesus' birth and his consecration to God at the temple, can you honestly deny that Paidian can only mean child or son here? Come on now. The second assumption is that the Son of God means nothing more than a servant of God. 
term of endearment if you like. The problem is that the Bible is clear about sons and daughters being of higher status than servants. In Matthew chapter 17 verses 24 to 27 we read, When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. Sons are exempt from paying the tax. Others are not. John chapter 8 verses 34 to 36. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. A slave or servant has no permanent place in the house, whereas a son abides forever. Hence why we need God's son to set us free from sin bondage. And in Mark chapter 12 verses 1 to 11, we read the parable of the wicked vine dressers. There once was a man who planted a vineyard and put a secure fence around it. He dug a pit for its wine press and erected a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenant farmers and traveled abroad. When the time of harvest came, he sent one of his servants to the tenants to collect the landowner's share of the harvest. But the tenants seized him and beat him and sent him back empty handed. So the owner sent another servant to them and that one they shamefully humiliated and beat over the head. So he sent another servant and they brutally killed him. Many more servants were sent, and they were all severely beaten or killed. The owner had only one person left to send, his only son, whom he dearly loved. So he sent him to them, saying, surely they will restrain themselves and respect my son. But the tenants saw their chance and said to one another, this is the heir, come, let us kill him and then we'll inherit it all. So they violently seized him, killed him, and threw his body over the fence. So what do you think the owner of the vineyard will do? He will come and put to death those tenants and give his vineyard to others. In the parable, the servants are the prophets of God. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day, yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. The beloved heir and son is none other than the Lord Jesus. Jesus didn't view himself as a mere servant like the others, like the rest of the prophets. He thought himself much higher and greater than them. Third assumption, Mark chapter 10 verses 41 to 45 and Matthew chapter 20 verses 24 to 28. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be servant, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in Luke 22 verses 24 to 27, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. And finally, in John chapter 13, verses 3 to 17, Jesus washes the feet of his disciples and says, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. See also Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11. New Testament authors clearly had no problem with Jesus being both the son and the servant. They go out of their way to identify Jesus as the son. See the following verses up on your screen now. In your own time, can't do it all for you. Just pause here and take note. The teachings of Jesus was like all of the prophets, but what happened is 
after Jesus left and we do not believe that Jesus was crucified. The Quran teaches us that crucifixion was the kind of punishment that was given to the very worst of criminals. Almighty God, Allah, saved Jesus from this humiliating death and he made like many miracles that God Almighty has performed and enabled. He put the image of Jesus onto a different man and Jesus was raised up to the heavens where he will remain until he returns back to fight the Antichrist. The Antichrist who will come and will claim to be a fault, will claim to be God. He will come with one eye and he will bring dead people alive and he will put in front of the people a piece of heaven will appear but it is really hell and a piece of hell but this is really heaven and only the true believers will be able to view on his forehead that he is a disbeliever and they will know that this heaven is in reality hell and this hell is in reality heaven so the believers will jump into what looks like hell knowing that this is really heaven and the disbelievers will jump into heaven not knowing that this is really hell why all the deception man for real so allah is a liar and a deceiver if god is good and just why would he forsake the followers of jesus he allowed for them all to be put to death some of them crucified executed died in prison stoned he allowed all of this for what for a lie a lie he knew was a lie nonsense also just a thought if all jesus did was come to the jews to call them all back to the Torah of Moses. For what reason would the super legalistic, well-respected Pharisees have wanted to kill him? So Jesus turns up and says, hey guys, we should follow the Torah and they wanna kill him? Why'd they get upset? Why'd they get the Romans to crucify the brother? Nonsense. So he will come back and he will fight this antichrist and he will come back and he will destroy the cross kill the pig. Why? Because we know now, in reality, no matter how much we try to avoid this, that the cross has become like an idol. You mean like Muhammad? You mean like the Kaaba? The cross has become like an idol. People, they wear the cross around their neck and they hold it when they pray. This has almost become something that people worship to, whether they like it or not. Just if a Muslim puts a piece of Quran around his neck and he holds this and he says, O oh, Quran, protect me, then he too is worshipping other than Almighty God. So he will return to destroy the cross because it has become like another God. I don't know a single Christian who worships the cross. I know Christians who wear a cross as a symbol or a reminder of the sacrifice Jesus made for our sins to be forgiven, but the glory is given to Jesus, not the cross. I have a cross on my wall. I can live without that. I can't live without him. It's not a deity. Relax, homie. Grasping at straws here. It has become a item of worship and two, because it is a false belief that he was crucified. And even if you look into the Bible, there are no clear witnesses or descriptions that clearly show and say we saw Jesus or they are contradicting each other when they talk about this crucifixion. Jesus' death is actually the most well attested to fact of ancient history. Let's look at four testimonies, two ancient and two current. We have the New Testament scholar and historian of early Christianity, John Dominic Crosson. He says, that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. We have the New Testament scholar and historian Gerd Ludemann. He says Jesus' death by crucifixion is indisputable. Josephus, everyone's favourite Jewish historian, who was also a priest and scholar. He says, When Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standard among us, meaning Jewish priests, those following the Torah of Moses, religiously, had condemned him to be crucified. And finally, we have the Roman public official or politician slash historian, considered by modern scholars to be the greatest Roman historian. Cornelius Tacitus, he says this, Nero fastened the guilt of the burning of Rome and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class called Christians by the populace Christos, 
from whom the name had its origins, suffered the extreme penalty at the hands of Pontius Pilate. Now, it's very important to realise that none of these men had anything to gain by attesting to the death of Jesus by crucifixion. They are essentially enemies of the faith, establishing the faith. So Islam teaches us that he was saved from this humiliating death and he was raised up which he is still now alive in the heavens with the Creator, Almighty God, Allah, and he will return. And when he returns and kills the Antichrist, he will then die a death and will be resurrected like all of us because the Quran says that every soul shall taste death. Why? Why? Jesus in Islam makes no sense. He has no purpose in the Islamic context. He makes no impact on the world or on the religion of Islam, according to Islam, other than the masses of people who were deceived, apparently. So for what reason, my Muslim friends, for what reason would Jesus have had a miraculous birth? performed miracles, raised the dead, and be condemned to death, only to be saved from death and taken to live in heaven with Allah, to return one day and kill the Antichrist. Which, by the way, also makes no sense. Why would there be an Antichrist if Christ isn't Christ at all? Moreover, if Muhammad was the final prophet, why is Jesus coming back? Doesn't that make him the final prophet? The only reason Islam includes Jesus is because they need to explain him away. Islam stands on the denial of both the historical Jesus, whom even secular historians will attest to, so this isn't just a Christian conspiracy, but also the denial of the deity of Jesus. We will see that the followers of Jesus remained on that correct belief. They said, that God is one and Jesus is the messenger and servant of God. And this is historically proven. Historically proven? Okay, how's that then? If you go through the books of history, you'll find that they remained on this belief. Ah, the books of history, of course. Any in particular? No? Okay, moving on. The first time that the concept of Jesus died for our sins and Jesus is the physical begotten Son of God, came from Paul. Now he came forward after Jesus by around 60 to 70 years. And he was paid by the Romans as a bounty hunter to go and capture the believers of Jesus and the followers of Jesus to be tortured or imprisoned or exiled. He was one time on a journey. He was traveling from Palestine to Damascus, on the road to Damascus. And he says that he had a vision and a trance where Jesus came to him and told him that people do not need to follow the law of Moses. They just have to believe that I died for their sins and they will be saved. And he was the first person to come with this. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee. He was a legalistic Jew. He was highly ranked. He wasn't a bounty hunter. Why, why would he change sides? He hated Christians. He hated Jesus. It went against everything he dedicated his life to, everything he believed in. This guy even acknowledges that Paul had a vision of Jesus. Only the dialogue didn't quite go down that way. Acts chapter nine verses one to seven is where we read about this encounter Paul has on the road to Damascus, on his way to kill Christians. This falls apart immediately because Paul, Paul was a Jew, he followed the Torah. Muslims will claim that the early Christians were actually Muslims, basically. That they did not confess the deity of the Lord Christ. So what is actually being said here is that Paul, the Jew, came to kill the early Christians who weren't really doing anything against the Jews. Doesn't make any sense. Either the Christians were saying something that was heretical towards the Jews or nothing, because there's no other reason Paul would hate them and seek them out to murder them. So the early Christians must have been saying something 
controversial. So in Acts, we read that Jesus actually said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Paul said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. That was his conversation with the risen Jesus. Who appointed him as an apostle? Was he a prophet of God? No. And if you look at his life before this, he did not live a good life. But when you look at all of the prophets and their childhood and their life, they were always of good and righteous nature. They were always of a holy nature. Good righteous lives, huh? Yeah, that's who God chooses. Abraham committed idolatry and adultery. Don't get me started on David. Elijah was a sad sack, bit of a wet blanket sometimes. Made up for it though. Jacob had way too many wives, plus adultery. And Jonah straight up bounced. He wanted Nineveh to just burn in hell. Couldn't care less. The prophets weren't called because they were holy and righteous. They were chosen and consecrated to carry out the will of God. His strength shows through our weakness. Beautiful. These were great men of God, but it wasn't because they were perfect. It was because they were obedient unto the Lord. So you'll see that he came back with this concept. And when he came back, the followers of Jesus denied him. And they looked at him as a heretic because he came back with teachings that were never taught to the disciples. Even some of the disciples who were alive at that time, they said that this is not the teachings of Jesus and he was not allowed to preach. And he tried to preach again and he was stopped by the followers of Jesus from preaching because they said, what you are preaching is not the word of Jesus. But in the end, he was allowed by the Roman government to continue his message. And this is where the Pauline branch of Christianity came around and the concept of the son and the father and Jesus dying for our sins and God having a physical begotten son this is where it developed. Nope. Acts chapter 9 verses 26 to 28. And that's where we're going to leave it. Dun, dun, dun. Look out for part two where we'll be looking at two additional questions raised by our homeboy. I don't know his name. It's nowhere to be found. Thank you for watching. My name is Christ Defender. I defend the Christian faith. If you like what I do and would like to support me, please follow the Patreon link in the description below. If you'd like to see more videos, subscribe and turn on notifications. I post every Saturday. You can also find me on TikTok and Instagram. Check me out. See you later. Why?